اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین بارئ الخلائق اجمعین باعث الانبیاء والمرسلین ثم الصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین خاتم النبیین شفیع المذنبین حبیب الہ العالمین بالقاسم المصطفی محمد محمد و آلی محمد و علی آلی بیته الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین و لعنت اللہ علی اعدائهم اجمعین من یوم عداوتهم الی یوم الدین اما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وكذلك جعلناكم أمة وسطا لتكونوا شهداء على الناس ويكون الرسول عليكم شهيدا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. It's due to that kindness and mercy that we have these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and glorification of Him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. We then send our condolences to our 12th and living Imam, Al-Hujjah, Ajalallahu Ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif, and to each and every one of you as we gather on this evening to commemorate the Shahadat anniversary of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhima afdalu salatu was salam Allah salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad We pray to Allah azza wa jal that we all get an opportunity to go for his ziyarat to Najaf insha'Allah and that we receive his shafa'at in the hereafter For the past two nights we have been discussing a very specific topic and that is regarding the qualities required to develop an ideal Islamic community. Um, and we're looking for the criteria of this ideal Islamic community from the teachings of our first Imam alayhi salam. And so as we have talked about and as you would have been able to make the connection, these are points that the Imam either exhibited in his own life that the Imam talked about, and these are the institutions that he tried to establish during the four and a half years that he was the Khalifa. And so we're looking at these teachings as a whole, and then from it extrapolating five points to create a blueprint for us to try to see we can adopt into our own communities so that we can create this type of community that our Imam wanted for us. Um, as I have been saying, but I say this every night because, you know, in the month of Ramadan, sensitivities are high, you know. Um, and so when I talk about this ideal community or when I mention aspects of an ideal community, neither do I have Masumin Islamic Center in my mind when I'm talking about these things, nor do I have myself in mind. I'm really looking at just the blueprint of what a community should look like. Right? And so it's really important that we don't try to pigeonhole or assume I'm talking about certain things. Um, these assumptions honestly only come about because we are sensitive right now in the state of hunger. Yeah? So think rationally, understand that we're not trying to pinpoint these to anything. Yesterday we looked at two qualities that are essential and these were the first two qualities of an intentional community and that is that they have number one the first quality is that there has to be a unity of purpose for any community for that community to work well together they have to be unified when it comes to the purpose of their existence and so if Within that community, you have people who want certain things and different things. That community eventually will fracture and they will splinter off because the unity was never there. And so we said that the unity of purpose has already been told to us because we are an Islamic Shia community. 
And so we don't have to invent what the goal is. Allah has told us what the goal is, right? And so the goal is to secure our faith and prepare for the hereafter. That's the first goal. The second aspect is that we have to, in any community, select the right leader, right? And we said that whether we want to look at that subject as um, an administrative leader or a religious leader, the criteria is the same, that this leader has to be someone who, number one, exhibits the qualities of increasing their iman and planning for the hereafter, and that leader has to be capable enough to take us down that path. And so we don't try to charter our own course, we follow the leader. And the leader, he says, you will take me to Jannah, so take me to Jannah now and I put my trust in you. So these two, the Imam exhibited during the course of his life. There are three other qualities that we want to discuss. Today we're only going to discuss one because it's split into many different components. And the quality today that we want to talk about that is essential for the success of a community is the mutual cooperation that exists between the members of that community. Right? Yesterday we talked about leadership. Today we talk about the community as a whole. And for there to be success in the community, for a community to stay cohesively together, there has to be mutual cooperation within the community. Allah Azza wa Jal talks about this, the importance of mutual cooperation in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 2, addressing believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. And then He describes certain things for the believer. But then He comes to the part where He says, Wa ta'awanu ala al-birri wa taqwa He says, cooperate with one another, O believers, with the basis of bir and taqwa, piety and God consciousness. He doesn't say cooperate with one another based on ethnicity, on culture, the fact that you're the same gender, you're the same. No, you cooperate with one another, putting God first. And that is why we said the unity and of the goal of our community has been established for us. It's always God first, right? And so the expectation is that you and I, God says, as believers, our responsibility is to cooperate with one another, work with one another with the goal of trying to reach that conclusion or that end that we have come together and accepted that that is our end, which is success in the hereafter. There is no other end that matters. I'm telling you right now, right? That if we, for example, are able to build a very beautiful mosque, but if that mosque is not going to help me secure my akhirah, then it was a wasted mosque. Yeah? If I, for example, have many different functions, because don't get that... Confused, right? Allah talks about a masjid that was a masjid ud dirar, yeah, a masjid that is created based on the concept of fitna. So, can there be a masjid that is fitna? Of course, there can, right? And so, what's important for us is to create this environment that will take us down that path of success. And as Allah says, "Wala ta'awanu ala ithmi wal udwan," and do not cooperate with one another in things which will lead you to sin and transgression. And so the idea is that when we look at a community here, or any community, it is made up of individuals. Individuals have their own preferences, they have their own likes, they have their own dislikes. It is very easy for us to get caught up on these periphery ideas and cause tension and fights with these periphery ideas about our preferences, for example, about our cultural habits, for example, when in the grand scheme of things, these things do not matter. Yeah? They absolutely do not matter. What matters is, do we collectively drive forward towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do we collectively get the goal of securing our akhirah? This mutual cooperation, when you find a community where the people cannot get past the human differences that exist between each other, like think about it, in a home you have a, let's just say in a home you have a husband and a wife or children and a mother and children or a father. These are two people at the very minimum who have different likes and dislikes and is there not chaos within the home sometimes? Of course there is. 
Now you multiply that by 600 people. You're telling me there is not going to be chaos? Of course there is, right? But you will notice that the chaos always is around the periphery issues. It is not around the core. There is never chaos within a community or hardly ever is there chaos in the community because that community and that leadership of that community are failing to take us towards Allah. Yeah? But we argue about what? Food. Yeah? We fight with each other about timing of the program. We fight each other about these periphery things that at the end of the day, these things don't matter. Yeah? But we will fight with each other. But this is why God says, Ta'awanu alal birri wa taqwa. Cooperate with each other in piety. Yeah? In God consciousness. That means if you think you can do it better, volunteer. Give your time to that community rather than simply complain. Anyone can complain. Right? But Allah Azza wa Jal says that what I want from you is mutual cooperation. Right? And so the idea of mutual cooperation is something that we have to try to understand because it's made up of different components. And I want to talk about these components today. So the idea is mutual cooperation. Right? And part of that mutual cooperation is that it's made up of what we're going to discuss at least five components. Five components that when we bring it all together, and if we can do it successfully, cohesively, what we will find is we will have a community that God is pleased with because we get along with each other. Right? We get along with each other. And then that community is not... It doesn't matter what race you are, what nationality you are, ethnicity you are. If we have the focus established, Man, we're going to be, we'll work really well together, insha'Allah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So as I said, there are five aspects to this that I want to try and discuss today. The first is that for there to be mutual cooperation within a community, there has to be a genuine love and desire for serving others. Yeah? That means when we are part of a community, I should have a goal of not only ensuring that my needs are met, but I try to figure out how I can utilize my skills to serve other people. As we've said, a community is made up of individuals. Each individual has tremendous potential, tremendous potential. Sometimes we, we may doubt our potential, but man, we always need more hands. Yeah? We always need more minds. We always need more voices, right? And so I look to see how I can incorporate myself to try and give back to the community. You know, what's interesting about this is that... I've, we'll get to this point in a second, sorry. Um, I've talked about this many times, that... One of the greatest honors a human being can achieve in Islam, right, is when they, when they place the comfort of others above their own comfort. It's one of the highest honors in Islam. And this is known, when this quality is achieved in a person, it's the quality of ithar, you know, to be a person who sacrifices of themselves for the betterment of other people. Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Ahma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Has numerous traditions that talk about the importance of ethar. I'm just going to quote a couple for us to understand its importance, right? Like, he, for example, says, or he's reported to have said, Al ethar ahsanu al ihsan wa a'ala maratib al iman. Yeah? To cater for others and to sacrifice from your own comfort for the comfort of others is the best form of ihsan, the best form of kindness that a person can do and it comes from the highest rank of iman, right? It's not something that is, like, it's not something to volunteer is not something, especially if you love to volunteer, you know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> There are people who are born to volunteer, right? And then there's the rest of us. You understand? The rest of us will volunteer when required, but no, but there are people who genuinely don't mind standing in the parking lot right now. Genuinely. 
genuinely don't mind being in the kitchen right now. Genuinely don't mind setting up right now while we're sitting, right? Um, there are people, Allah has blessed those people with something remarkable, something remarkable, right? Um, but what we don't understand is that that drive, if it's done honestly and selflessly, the translation of that, that drive is that it, it shows a very high level of iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? A very high level of, of faith in Allah. As I said, if it's done in the right manner, without wanting anything for that in return. In another hadith, the Imam alayhi salam said, Afdalu sakha al ithar That the best form of generosity is self-sacrifice. The best form of generosity. So I can be generous with my money, I can be generous. You know, I can often be generous in life with things that don't really affect me that much. Right? So for example, today like I can give money at the push of a button, I can donate to a cause. I didn't inconvenience myself at all in that. You know? But then there is an in, there is a, have I been generous? Of course I've been generous. And that's why Jud, Karam, all of these different attributes of generosity are on one side, where I can give, I can be open-handed, but in these, it's not necessary that I'm inconveniencing myself. Yeah? But I'm still being generous. You understand? Sometimes, depending on the capacity of an individual, they can volunteer, let's say, six hours in a soup kitchen or at the mosque, but they didn't feel inconvenienced, right? Because they loved it. And maybe that's the catch of being born with this quality, right? That you didn't feel inconvenienced. But that's all generosity. But then there's ithar. Ithar is where you inconvenience yourself for the convenience of others and you love it. You love it, right? And so in whatever thing that we do, try to the best of your ability, without violating the rights of other people, to, to give to the extent where it pinches you to give, where it pinches you to volunteer. You know, there's a limit we all have. Right? I've touched upon this many times as well. Um, that for example, let's say there's a cause you have to donate to. I can donate 50 bucks, and it's not even going to phase me to donate 50 bucks. Right? It's 50 bucks, but it's, like, but it's not going to hurt me. But man, 75, that's going to pinch. Just a little bit is going to pinch, right? Now it doesn't mean that like I'm going to go broke. We're not talking about going broke. But it's going to be like, ooh, 75? Don't give 75. It's nice to be pinched. It's nice to be felt this tug because now we are bordering on ethar. And that's how powerful ethar is. And so what we find is that in the concept of, of self-sacrifice, as we said, there are people who are born with this. And then there's the rest of us. And the rest of us, this is a quality that is important enough that we have to try and develop. We have to try for the sake of the strengthening of a community, practice volunteerism within that community. I have to give back. Yeah? all of us, for there to be an effective um, mutual cooperation between each other. Volunteering is at the core of this, right? You know, there's two things that happen when we volunteer, right? The first thing that happens when we volunteer is that we begin to appreciate what the volunteers go through, right? Um, like right now, like, let's just, like I said, it's not for this, but I will use this community as an example, or any community, rather. So like for me, or let's just say you, <clears throat> like you go to work all day, for example, and then you come to mosque, and then you sit in this mud list, and you possibly fall asleep because you're so tired, right? But these guys in the back will work all day, and then will work here as well. You understand? Right? I don't appreciate that until I do it one day. Right now it's easy for me to say, ah, this, they're, what are they tired about? Right? Like they suck it up, put your big boy boots on, handle it, serve me. Right? I can say all of these things. 
But my God, you go do it for a month. And then tell me how nice it was. You'll appreciate. So when we serve... We, number one, appreciate. We appreciate what the volunteers are doing. But on the flip side as well, for the volunteers, when, when it removes resentment from those people who don't volunteer. See, because it's, when we're talking about a community, it's not just one-sided. Right? It's not just about what I think about the volunteers. But man, what do the volunteers think about me? Right? It's quite possible, and I'm sure they don't, but the volunteers look at us and say, these guys are lazy. You know, These guys are entitled. I'm not saying that they do it, but this is how shaitan manipulates us. Yeah? We're supposed to have good intention. But if that was the case, we would have good intentions about them. But we don't oftentimes. Right? And so you wonder, why don't we have good intentions about them? Is because shaitan manipulates us. This is how shaitan works, right? But on the flip side, we don't understand sometimes that shaitan manipulates them too. To look at us and say, look at these guys entitled. Just sitting there, waiting tea to be served, water, call them like, hey, chai liao. Right? Like we do these things, right? But the idea is that if I volunteer, then maybe I remove that resentment from them. And so by volunteering, I'm actually helping create a more cohesive cooperation between this community and I'm easing the burdens of each other. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So the first point for mutual cooperation is a genuine love and a development of love for serving other people. That's part of mutual cooperation. The second point that comes up is a regarding mutual cooperation is that there has to be a willingness to forgive and overlook unpleasantness from other people. Right? So within a community, no one, no one is perfect. We accept that no one is perfect. Maybe if I start with myself and I say, you know what, Jafar, you're not perfect. As hard as that is to believe, yeah? I'm not perfect. And so I start with myself. Thank you for getting that, Jerry. I appreciate that. Yeah? Um, I start with myself. No one is perfect, right? I'm not perfect. And so if I accept that I'm not perfect and you're not perfect, if something happens during the course of the day that, 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 that maybe I didn't like, I should be quick to overlook that mistake. Yeah? It may bug me. Right? But then if it bugs me, you got to ask yourself, is this a core principle or a periphery? Right? Like what we talked about in the beginning. Is this behavior going to hurt my chance of getting closer to God on the Day of Judgment? Or is it just going to bother me right now in dunya? Right? And oftentimes, it's only going to bother me in dunya. Well, I have to learn to forgive those things. Yeah? I have to learn to overlook those things. Here, of course, we're talking about things which are not done maliciously, right? Like out of intent to harm. These are just things that happen. Right? Whatever these things are, whether it be from us, the general people, so the, the volunteers, like if I, you do something to me, I do something to you, ah, it happens, yeah? Okay, let's get past it because this is the Quranic principle. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nur, I really like this verse because how God phrases it, you know? He says, وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَسْفَحُوا Right? He says, pardon and overlook. It's an amr. Then pardon and overlook. So like, I can pardon, but then I don't form an opinion about you to say, this guy's going to do this again, isn't he? Right? Overlook it. Let it go. Right? Pardon and overlook. Why? أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Do you not wish God to forgive your mistakes? Right? Beautiful principle. Like, I can't forgive you but Ya Allah, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa We'll do it 170 times today. Right? But I can't forgive each other for mistakes. Mistakes that are periphery related. Do you understand? Like this is what holds back a community. What holds back a community is that we pick on things that are not affecting my akhirah. And then when that's the goal, and I'm fighting over you about this thing that is not affecting my akhirah. Right? And so the first thing we have to understand is that we have to learn to let things go. Now what about if there are things that are done from people who are just bad people? 
right? So the first thing is, is that there was no malicious intent. This is just you and I just butting heads today because I had a bad day. You know what I mean? Tomorrow I'll come back, I won't have a bad day, I won't be the same person. Overlook that stuff. That stuff is just shaitan's weaponry. Shaitan's just throwing darts. If it hits something, he'll connect, right? But if we just defend ourselves and say, I'm not going to let shaitan hit me with these darts, it'll be alright. But then, there are people who are bad people. There are people who have bad intent, right? And when it comes to people who have bad intent, people who seek to demean me, people who seek, who seek to, for example, lecture at me, bring me down. Um, you know, there's a, there's a qaida, there's a rule that Imam Ali teaches us. It's a really beautiful rule, you know. The rule basically is that don't let anyone ever humiliate you. Yeah? But don't ever resort to oppressing someone for their oppression on you. You understand? Okay? So, hey, hat min adhilla. We accept that. You will not humiliate me. You talk to me like a person. Don't talk down to me. Don't yell at me. Don't point at me. Don't make these gestures. We don't ever treat each other that way. Right? But at the same time, if you treat me that way, I will not resort to treating you like that. Right? And you know where we get this rule? We get this rule from this amazing letter. Yeah? You know, Muawiyah the Mal'oon writes a letter to Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Ma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And you find this letter number 28 in Nahjul Balagha. You know, in this letter, the Mal'oon Muawiyah, he, tied, he, he tries to mock the Imam. And he tries to mock him. Why? Because he says that you were the one who was dragged on the streets by Abu Bakr to go give bayats to him. Right? After Saqifa and what happened, Imam was, was, was treated in, in a manner that was not behooving the status of the Imam. Right? And so Muawiyah begins to mock him and say, you were dragged through the streets the way a camel is dragged through the land. The camel that refuses to budge basically. Right? And the Imam alayhi salam replies back in this way. And this is where we develop this qaida, this rule. The Imam alayhi salam says, فَقُلْتَ وَقُلْتَ That you said, إِنِّي كُنْتُ أُقَادُ كَمَا يُقَادُ الْجَمَلْ الْمَخْشُوشْ حَتَّى أُبَايَعْ He says, you say that I was dragged like a camel with a nose string. So you drag the camel by the nose string. He says, you say, I was dragged like this camel to swear allegiance to Abu Bakr. He says, وَلَا عَمْرُ اللَّهِ yeah, He says, by, the, by God, by the eternal Allah, لَقَدْ أَرَدْتَ أَن تَدُمَّ فَحَمَدْتَ He says, you sought to humiliate me, but you ended up praising me, the Imam says. SubhanAllah, look at the logic of the Imam. He says, you wanted to humiliate me by saying that. He said, in fact, you have praised me. And you said, you wanted to humiliate me, but you ended up humiliating yourself by telling this. Why? Why did the Imam say? He says, وَمَا عَلَى الْمُسْلِمْ أَنْ غَضَادَتِي فِي أَنْ يَكُونَ مَظْلُومًا He says, there is absolutely... Nothing wrong with a believer being mazloom as long as that believer is not a zalim. You understand? Subhanallah. What a qaida. He said, there is nothing wrong with me being mazloom. He says, where is there dishonor in being mazloom? We believers are mazloom. We are oppressed, but we never become a zalim. Never become a zalim. You understand? This is the qaida, my brothers and sisters. People say stuff about you, you don't have to take it. You can stand your ground. But don't ever retort back in the way where you now are considered a zalim, the way they are a zalim in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the second principle that is important for us to understand is a willingness to overlook unpleasantness. And then knowing where to stand when that unpleasantness has reached a position of maliciousness. We follow? That's number two. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Ya Ali. The third point yeah, that is 
important for mutual cooperation. And again, this is a very simple point, but Imam talks about this, where he says, we don't look at the faults of other people, right? Um, we don't look around. You know, when you look around long enough, you will find faults in everybody, right? Because no one is perfect. It goes back to this principle. But we have to realize that with the acceptance that everyone has faults, my responsibility is to not spend time thinking about other people's faults, right? Not only should I not spend time thinking about other people's faults, I should also be very careful about the things that I say to people. You understand? Um, you know, Imam Amir al muminin he says, Inna linnasi uyuba. He says, every single human being has ayub, aib, they have deficiencies. Every single human being. Wasturul aura mastata'ata. Hide the faults of other people to the best of your ability. Yasturillahu subhana ma tuhibba satru. Allah will hide your faults, he says. Right? Hide the faults of other people, Allah will hide your faults. You know, I want to share a very, very personal example, a very personal example. Um, and I share these examples, I'm never shy about sharing personal examples because I think they only, I only share it to serve a greater purpose. And I hope this, and I think this will serve a really important purpose because I've been trying to figure out how to say this for a long time. You know, when I was in my early 20s, early 20s, teenage 20s, up to my late 20s, I used to be a very fit guy, yeah? I used to have no belly, like skinny, yeah? Um, play sports four or five times a week. And then as I got older, I got a desk job, right? I sit for a living on a member, for example, right? And I began to put on weight, correct? Okay? Now, do you think I don't know that I put on weight? Of course I know I put on weight. I don't need you to tell me, Molana Sahib, you put on a little weight. Do you understand? Right? I don't need you to tell me that. Because don't you think I know, I don't know I put on weight? I don't need you when you talk to me to look at my stomach and look at me. Look at my stomach and look at me. We're laughing. I swear to you, this hasn't happened to me. Yeah? Because out of respect or fear, people don't do this to me. But this happens in our community all the time. Yeah? We make insensitive comments to each other. Yeah? People who have put on weight, you don't think they're struggling with their weight problem? You think they're not? Of course they are. Do you really think they need to hear this from the aunties of the mosque or the uncles from the mosque? Yeah? People who are not married, you don't think that they are wanting to get married? Do you think they really need to hear from us? Yeah, do you really think they need to hear that? People who can't have married couples who can't have children. Yeah? Maybe they've had miscarriages. Maybe, we don't know. We don't know the business of people. But what good is my asking them, yeah? When will you have kids? My brothers and sisters, we've been dealing with this nonsense for so long. So long. Just not thinking before we talk. Yeah? We need to be better than this. Do you understand? The fact that I even think about the uyub of other people is talking about a deficiency in me, not in them. Do you understand? The fact that I notice these things about other people, that speaks volumes about me, not them. Right? And I have to be a better person than that. So even if I think it, don't say it. Don't say it. How can I expect God to hide my deficiencies? You know, people who make comments like this live under this bubble that they are perfect. Yeah, they forget that they, the, that they have their own deficiencies. Right? These are things that, that are present. And like now, like obviously, like if I'm sitting with you and you have like spinach stuck in your teeth, I'm going to tell you privately, Baba, that's not an abe. Right? That's something else altogether. I said, Baba, get that spinach out your tooth. Right? I'll tell you that, no problem, because I like you, that's why I tell you that. But you putting on weight and me telling you, ah, what's up with this weight? What kind of insensitivity is that? Right? What kind of community are we developing? 
where if I say that to someone, do you think they are really excited to come back to that community again? No! And if I could be the one who fractures the community, right? And so I've been planning to say this for a while, but the best way to do so was to use myself as an example of this, yeah? That this happens. We just have to be more sensitive. Don't look for the faults of other people, right? And we have to work together to get past this notion of these type of uh, behavior and speech. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So that's number three. We said there's five points. Two more points. You were lucky today. You know, the Marsha reciters and Dua reciter recited very fast today, alhamdulillah. Yeah? So you, you are lucky at the end because you get to hear me for another five, seven minutes, right? Um, the fourth yeah, point of mutual cooperation and that there has to be within a community a system for complaints to be registered anonymously. Yeah? This is really interesting, you know. It is said in the books of Tariqh, in the books of history, وَكَانَ لِأَمِيرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ بَيْتٌ سَمَّاهُ بَيْتُ الْقَصَصِ That Imam السلام, had a home or a, or, a, or a location which he called Bayt al-Qasas, the house of complaints. وَيُلْقَ النَّاسِ فِيهِ رُقَاؤُهُمْ And people used to anonymously drop complaints about him or his government in this box. SubhanAllah. Right? Like who knew that at that time, Imam had instituted this, right? Today, even though we are overlooking the mistakes of people, we are pardoning the mistakes of people, but maybe sometimes what is happening is just wrong. And again, these are wrongs that, that are not... Sure, can we complain about periphery things? Yes, no one's saying you can't complain. But oftentimes, periphery things are very subjective, right? And so if I'm complaining about the timing of something, someone else may not have a problem with the timing of that. If I'm complaining about food, someone else didn't feel the, doesn't feel the same way. But if I'm complaining about the core, the, the aspect of unity of our community, that is important. Right? But either way, the complaint aspect today, like we send emails, but then you're not anonymous. Right? Um, but the Imam السلام, had set up this idea, and I think if the Imam had done it, clearly he wants us to be able to do it as well. Right? Because someone may be shy to come forward and complain. And so the Imam السلام, did this. So this is the fourth, that there has to be a mechanism to, to complain. Because sometimes my complaint may not be about you. My complaint could be about the leader. And I need to be able to address that, right? And so I complain. And then if something happens from it, something happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But at least I done my job in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the fourth principle. And we'll repeat these four again, but inshallah you are with me so far. The fifth principle is, is again, I think this is, 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 it ties in to this discussion. And that is to consult and seek the opinions of the individuals within the community. So you have leadership, you have the people, but there has to be a mechanism to bring about mutual coexistence where the members of the community do not feel as though their voice is not heard within the community. So they don't feel like these guys just do what they want, they don't listen to us. No, there has to be transparency, right? There has to be... Um, openness about what's happening. And again, like if you look at these five things, right? Like amazingly, I think even though we're not talking about Masumin, like we do a lot of these things, alhamdulillah. You know, like there is, we are, as I said in the first night, and I say this without bias whatsoever, I've been to many communities. We are one of the closest communities I've seen to reaching that goal. We're not there yet by any means, right? But compared to other communities that I've visited, we're on the right track, right? We just have to make tweaks. And so this is one of those things that I think we do well, but it has to be continued. At the end of the day, everyone should have a voice. And it's not just about voting. Well, that's important. But even when it comes to creating a plan forward. But what you also have to understand, or what we have to understand, is that at the end of the day, what is good for the collective will always take place. 
right? So individually, I may want something. I may think this is good. I may, and we've seen this in the past. We've taken out surveys where we got a question with 70 different replies because 70 people took that survey. Now, how are you going to incorporate that into the community? You can't, right? And so you can you can lump things together and then create a plan about how we were going to bring out a change. But this is something that Allah Azza wa Jal talks about in the Holy Quran. Allah says in Surah Al-Shura, وَالَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ He's talking about the mutawakkilun, those who put their trust in God. They are those who answer the call of their Lord. وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةِ And they establish their salah. وَأَمْرُهُمْ shura بَيْنَهُمْ And their affairs are based on consultation with each other. Our first Imam alayhi salam talks about this a lot, where he says, Al istisharatu Ainul Hidayah. Counsel is to guidance. Well, well the, the first part was that counsel is to guidance as the eyes are to the body. Confining solely to one's own opinion is risky and dangerous. You can't just say this is what we're going to do without consulting and knowing what people want. And so it's important again that if we develop all of these things that we're talking about. You see, if the unity is not, is not, is not unified upon, the goal, if the goal of the community is not unified, right? So what that means is that like we are here for different reasons. Some people are here because it's a time pass. It's a good time pass, wholesome time pass. Other people are here because it's a good place to bring your kids. They're not better than... But there are some people here who are here because this is the way God wants us to secure our akhirah through a community, right? If all of us can have these secondary goals but unite on the primary goal, then everyone's opinion has a lot of weight. Do you understand? But if we're all having different opinions or we're here for different... We're not unified on the goal then some people's opinions are detrimental more than beneficial. You understand or no? Yeah? It's a bit rough to understand, but it's important. Right? This is why sometimes then people are not consulted. Right? Um, because at the end of the day, if we're all not united, then obviously we're not going to have a common vision. Right? And so these five points... I want to just repeat the titles because I think these are important for mutual cooperation. Mutual cooperation is essential if we're going to go towards this development of an ideal community. What are these? Number one, to create a genuine love of serving other people. We all should have that. We should all take turns, volunteer, ask what we can do, what more we can do. Number two, a willingness to forgive and overlook disgruntledness from other people. Right? Because we're human beings. Number three, stop looking at the faults of people. Yeah? Number four, there must be a system where we can take complaints and register them. And number five, to consult and seek the opinions of the individuals of the community to make them realize that their voice matters. And if we can do these five things, then we will create the third building block of how to develop an ideal community. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Tonight, tonight we mourn the loss of a father. Yeah. We're on the night like this, and the late night in the morning like this, Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam leaves this world. But we look at the last few hours of the life of our Imam alayhi salam. You know, Muhammad bin Hanafiya, the son of our Imam alayhi salam, narrates that on the 21st of Shahru Ramadan, the poison had spread throughout the body of our Imam. His condition had deteriorated and the skin and the color of his skin had changed to a yellow, we are told. And at this point, the Imam alayhi salam knew that he was close to the end of his life and so he told his companions to go home. He said, allow me and my family to be together alone in these final moments so that my children can mourn, that the women in the house can cry without, without being worried about their voices being heard. And so the companions left 
And as the cries within the house began to rise, all of a sudden they heard a cry coming from outside the house. <laughs> Imam al Hassan alayhi salam comes out of his house and he says he sees Asbagh bin Nabata, close companion of the Imam, sitting outside crying with the family inside. Imam says to him, Ya Asbagh, the Imam Mawla asked you to leave, why don't you leave? And it is like Asbagh would reply, in other words, Asbagh would say, it is like he said, that wallah, I know my Imam told me to leave, but my legs have not allowed me to stand up from here. <laughs> it pains me to leave my Imam in this way. I cannot leave from here, he says, until I see the Imam one more time. It is that when Asbagh walks in, he sees the condition of our Imam alayhi salam. And immediately tears begin to come down his cheeks. The Imam says, La tabki ya asbagh, do not cry, asbagh wallah, fa innaha wallahi al jannah. By God, I am going towards paradise. Do not cry for me. What does asbagh say? Asbagh says, Mawlai, I have no doubt that you are heading towards jannah. وَإِنَّمَا أَبْكِي لِفَقْدِكَ يَا أَمِيرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ I am crying because I cannot live without you, O oh Amir al-Mu'mineen. Imam alayhi salam spends the last few moments of that time with Asbagh and then Asbagh leaves. It is said on these days, the one who was in charge of medicine, the doctor of that time, would come frequently to see Amir al-Mu'mineen. He just said one of the things he would do is he would change the cloth on the head of Imam. In these moments it is said that when he took off this cloth that was wrapped around the head of our Imam, he looked at this cloth and he said, Ya Amir al muminin there is nothing more that can be done. He said the poison has reached all the way to the brain and there is nothing more that we can do. He told his family, your responsibility now is just to make Imam comfortable. And so he said, bring him milk and milk would bring ease to his body. You know, it is said each time Imam would drink some milk from a glass. He would give that glass to Imam al Hassan and said, Oh my child, go and give this to Ibn Muljim. Let him know the compassion of his Imam. That even though he struck him, he has not forsaken him. But I wonder, my brothers and sisters, I wonder that if the Imam had another motive for doing this, for he was letting the people of Kufa know that, O oh Kufans, there will come a time when my son will ask for a cup of water for his six-month-old child. Do not deprive him at that time. The way I have not deprived <laughs> Wow, Husayna. The Imam was preparing the people of Kufa for this. It is that the Imam called his children towards him. He told them that it had been three days since he had the dream of his of Rasulullah. And he told him that he will join him in three days. He said, it has been three days, so listen to my last wasiyah. He says, Ya Aba Muhammad, Usika wa Ya Aba Abdillahi khaira, fa innama fa in fa minni wa ana min kuma. He says, I wish nothing but khair for the both of you, O oh Hassan and Hussein. You are from me and I am from you. And then he advises his children who are other than the children of Fatima. And he said, Wa awsahum an la yukhalifu awlaad Fatima. They do not go against the teachings and the guidance of the children of Fatima. And then the Imam said to Imam al Hassan, When I die, wash my body and apply that hunut. Which hunut was this? This was that hunut that was brought down from Jannah and given to Rasulullah. This was that hunut that was placed on 
on, on Khadija and it was placed on the Prophet and it was placed on Fatima. It was even going to be placed on Ali and would be placed on Hassan. But Ah uh, Hussein would not be cut. <laughs> Hussein's case was entirely different. <laughs> then the Imam alayhi salam advised final moments. It is said at this time, Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam saw her father wiping sweat from his forehead. <laughs> Why <Wow>, Imam? <laughs> <laughs> she inquired about the sweat on the forehead of Imam. The Imam said, Inna al mu'min idha nazala bihi al maut wa danat wa fatahu urika jabinuhu. That when a believer comes close to the time of death, sweat begins to appear on his forehead. It is said at that moment or around that time, the Imam fell asleep or went unconscious and then he woke up. And when he woke up from that sleep, he said, Hada Rasulullah, Hada Ammi Hamza, Hada Akhi Jafar. He says, I see the Prophet in front of me. I see Hamza, my uncle and my brother Jafar. The Imam turns towards the Qibla. The Imam stretches his hands and legs. The Imam begins to recite the Shahada, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Wahdahu la sharika la, Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh, Thumma kaza nahbahu, And then the Imam took his last breath, Rahimallahu man nada, Wa imama, Cry, even if you cannot cry, cry for your father like you would. Raise your voices, Ali is no longer. Ali is no more. The sound of tears come from the house of Zahra, from the house of Ali. And it is through these sounds the people of Kufa knew that Ali is no more. <laughs> سَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا يَمُنْقَلَبِ يَنْقَلِبُونَ وَالْآقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ مَا تَمَعَلِي